we're going to talk here about hematemesis and melena. And there's a big, huge differential for hematemesis and melena, as there is also for hematochesia. This, these aren't all-inclusive lists, uh, but I think these are some of the most prominent things, uh, as well as some of the most commonly tested things on uh, step two and three. So when we're thinking hematemesis and melena, we're thinking upper GI bleeds, uh, stereotypically. However, uh, and with hematemesis, it is always an upper GI bleed. But with melena, it could be an upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed because melena is just black stool. And uh, so if it's a, a very proximal lower GI bleed, uh, then it, it can be uh, melena as well. And as a matter of fact, one of these things is actually from a uh, the a, a lesion that is in the lower GI system. Um, so lower GI meaning distal to the ligament of tr trites and, uh, and proximal meaning proximal to the ligament of trites. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk here about hematemesis and melena, which is typically upper GI. Uh, so esophagus, stomach, duodenum. We're going to talk about five things, ruptured esophageal varices, which is uh, your biggest emergency out of all of these, then the Dulafoy lesion, peptic ulcer disease, Meckel's diverticulum, and then gastroesophageal cancer, which uh, all cause uh, hematemesis uh, or melena. Actually, one of them doesn't cause hematemesis. Uh, but uh, we're not going to talk about Mallory Weiss tear, celiac disease, esophagitis, gastritis, and aortoenteric fistula. They would be on your differential, possibly, uh, but I address these in other sections. So just out of the sake of time, keeping this relatively short, uh, I'm just going to talk about these five things. But if you want to, uh, if you want to review these things, I uh, put where you can find them. All right, the initial management for any upper GI bleeder, and most GI bleeds are upper uh, in the general population. In older patients, then it's more 50-50. Uh, but in the general population, most uh, GI bleeds are upper. And anytime we see hematemesis, we're thinking upper. It's got to be upper. If we're thinking melena, it's probably upper. So the first thing we do is for any patient, but especially people who are bleeding, we want to tend to their ABCs. And this comes before any kind of diagnostic step or any other treatment. So we're going to insert bilateral large bore IVs in case there's another episode of blood loss, in case they become hemodynamically unstable, if they have low blood pressure, or if there's been any significant uh, recent fluid loss, so something like vomiting or having lost blood. Um, or having been dehydrated, then uh, we're going to want to bolus them up with normal saline. And then we also, of course, want to make sure that their airway is secure. Uh, sometimes that can be a problem for patients who are actively vomiting. Um, and they've, if, especially if they've got, uh, if they're uh, unconscious or have an altered mental status. So the labs that we're going to order, uh, we're always going to want to get a CBC because uh, we're checking for infection there. Uh, we'll want to have a CMP, uh, not just a BMP. We want to make sure that we get the liver panels because some of these things are caused by liver uh, diseases. We'll also want to make sure that we get blood type and cross match and have packed red blood cells on hand because these patients are bleeding. So some of the times we might uh, need to transfuse them. We'll want to place an NG tube in a lot of cases. Uh, and that's because you can aspirate some of the uh, contents of the stomach and you can see if there's any blood uh, that's in the stomach. And if it's bright red blood, you know that there's an active bleed. If it's coffee grounds, you know that it might be coming from, a, uh, it might be coming from an ulcer. And so uh, that will help you uh, determine whether this is truly an upper GI bleed or whether this might be from something else that's in the intestines more distal. And then our big diagnostic test that we're going to use most of the time is an upper GI endoscopy, and that just helps us visualize uh, the esophagus and stomach and duodenum. Okay, so ruptured esophageal varices. These are emergencies, and this is dilated esophageal veins that ultimately become too dilated and then they rupture. And usually, when this presents, it's as massive hematemesis, sudden massive hematemesis in a patient who typically has long-standing liver problems. Most commonly, it's uh, cirrhosis of the liver due to alcoholism. This has a pretty significant mortality rate, especially if it's not treated quickly enough. 
so uh, making sure, of course, that you've got your ABCs taken care of is going to be really important here. A lot of times with esophageal varices, uh, the big hint is the patient's history. So history of alcohol abuse, IV drug use, cirrhosis, liver disease. So alcohol abuse because it causes cirrhosis, IV drug use because it puts you at risk of hepatitis, and then any other liver disease, hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, um, anything that affects the liver causes esophageal varices. Why? Because when the veins go back, and remember, everything that's coming from our lower extremity, uh, or a lot of stuff, is going to come through uh, the portal vein. Uh, if When things get clogged up in the liver, when you have cirrhosis, the blood is going to find a different way through uh, up into the uh, into the inferior vena cava up to go back into the heart, and so those veins are around the esophagus inside the esophagus, and so it's it's just as if you were to uh, cut off the interstate, cut off the main highway, and people have to detour on the side roads. You're going to have a lot of traffic because those roads aren't capable of handling it, and. Uh, so because you have these veins that aren't capable of carrying this massive amount of blood, they can, uh, they do dilate and then ultimately what happens is they can rupture and that's what causes this uh, problem. So the symptoms is melena with or without hematemesis. So melena is always going to happen with esophageal varices because there's always bleeding if you have a ruptured esophageal varus. Um, now, you may not have hematemesis if it's just a small, small bleed. If it's not massive, if it's just a small bleed, you might not throw it up. It, you might not vomit it. So it, it might just be in, uh, in the stool. Uh, but most of the time, there is hematemesis, but there's always going to be melena present. But sometimes it presents as hematemesis, sometimes it pre presents as melena. Uh, what you should be doing is, of course, looking for signs of liver failure, which you would see in most patients with uh, esophageal varices because the liver is usually uh, what causes the problem. So definitely be looking for scleral icterus, which would come before jaundice, and then uh, other things such as ascites, which shows uh, the portal hypertension, spider angiomata, uh, uh, hepatosplenomegaly, and then uh, gynecomastia. Remember, uh, that the liver is responsible for breaking down estrogen. And so in men uh, who have liver failure, their estrogen levels go up, and so that causes gynecomastia. So these are some things that you'll see with uh, liver failure. And there's lots of other classic symptoms of liver failure, but these are some of the ones that uh, come to mind. Some symptoms of chronic anemia might be present. Uh, and then, uh, of course, if the patient had a severe acute blood loss, they may be in shock. So low blood pressure, increased heart rate, and uh, so forth. And remember, we always tend to the ABCs first. What do we see on our labs that we ordered? Well, if, when we have our CBC, typically there's going to be an anemia, uh, and that can be due to the blood loss. It can also be due to anemia of chronic disease because these patients have chronic cirrhosis and inflammation. Uh, their uh, CMP is usually pretty much always going to come back with elevated AST and ALT, and oftentimes it's going to be a high AST to ALT ratio. That ratio is usually about 2.5 to 1, and that high AST to ALT ratio signifies that you've got uh, alcoholic liver disease. Typically, the normal ratio of AST to ALT is 1 to 1, if not a little less than 1 to 1. You may also see elevated ammonium, and then the PT is usually elevated because the liver being diseased can't produce the factors uh, that it normally produces. Remember the factors that liver produces, uh, 2, 5, 7, and 10, I think, if I remember correctly. Anyhow, your PT will be elevated. The best initial step in diagnosis for uh, esophageal varices is going to be an EGD, and that's uh, not just because it's the best initial step in diagnosis, but it's also the best initial step in treatment. Uh, most of the time, the EGD is going to help you uh, be able to definitively treat these patients. You're not going to get rid of the varices, but you'll get be able to stop the bleeding at least. So for treatment, we administer octreotide. Octreotide is... Uh, it, uh, is a vasoconstrictor, particularly of the splanchnic veins. 
and that's going to uh, reduce the bleeding. And then endoscopically, we correct the varices either through sclerotherapy uh, or through banding. Uh, now, the wrong answer is, uh, is uh, treatment with beta blockers. Beta blockers do play a role in esophageal varices, but it plays a role for patients who have esophageal varices that haven't ruptured yet. They're no good. Beta blockers are no good in uh, varices that have already ruptured. Uh, the ultimate therapy, uh, surgical therapy, second line therapy though, is TIPS uh, or portocaval shunt. And what that's just doing is it's making a shunt and rerouting the, uh, the blood from the uh, portal vein to the inferior vena cava. And that's going to uh, allow, that's going to kind of make a, a big side road so you don't have to get all the blood moving through the back roads. Uh, kind of going with that analogy. Uh, you're, you're making a shunt so that you're not pushing all that blood through the esophageal veins and putting yourself at risk for uh, a rupture. Uh, but the initial treatment is octreotide and endoscopic uh, correction via sclerotherapy and banding. Now, if you are at a point where it's taking too long for sclerotherapy and banding, uh, and perhaps there you might be... Uh, sending the patient off to surgical therapy. There is something called uh, a Singiston Blakemore tube. It's like a balloon uh, that you put in, and that can be put in temporarily. But the, the first step is octreotide and endoscopic correction of varices. 90% of the time, it's going to be effective. So here's an esophageal varus uh, that's ruptured, and you can see esophageal varices here. They're just veins, distended veins. And here's where the blood is coming out. So here's another one. Blood's coming out here. And then here's esophageal varices that look like they haven't ruptured yet, or maybe ever. And so maybe this would be a patient that you put on beta blockers to reduce their risk of having rupture. And then this is called a whale sign. So this is a recently, uh, th these esophageal varices recently ruptured. And so these red uh, kind of dots, red uh, spots here, it's called a whale sign. Uh, W-A-L-E, not whale like the fish. Uh, and this is a sign of recent rupture. Okay, Dulafoy's lesion is a large tortuous arteri uh, arteriole along the GI tract, usually the fundus of the stomach, the proximal part of the stomach, and it causes sudden hematemesis, often in a patient who doesn't have any risk factors or established diagnosis for liver disease or peptic ulcer disease. So this is something that happens congenitally or that you're born with. It's not something that happens because... Uh, you're, you're an alcoholic, now you've got liver disease, or uh, you've got peptic ulcer disease. So this could be just a typical patient with no other risk factors um, that just was born with this Dulafoy's lesion. And what can happen is that this can rupture. Uh, this typically presents as hematemesis because it's usually in the stomach. Uh, however, it can present also as melena if it's a small rupture. Uh, it can also present as melena if it's in the small intestine. And uh, with the Dulafoy lesions, 75% uh, of them are in the stomach, 14% are in the duodenum. So typically this is going to present with hematemesis and melena. However, some may present with hematemesis only and some may present with melena only. It's relatively rare. It only comprises 1-5% of upper GI bleeds. The history is going to be non-contributory. Uh, maybe they had possible issues with melena or hematemesis in the past that weren't diagnosed. And the reason uh, that that could be possible is uh, that Dulafoy's lesion is very, very difficult on endoscopy to find. And so sometimes you could have the melena or have the hematemesis and the endoscopist doesn't find the Dulafoy's lesion. And so maybe they'll make a diagnosis of something else uh, and uh, this is really uh, the diagnosis. So there may be a history of melena or hematemesis, but no, no diagnosis. Symptoms, uh, often bleeding is going to be really the only presenting symptom. Maybe they'll have anemia if they've had a chronic loss. Labs are usually going to be normal. Again, maybe anemia, uh, but uh, maybe not. Uh, so really with the Dulafoy's lesion, what you're dealing with is a patient who's just got upper GI bleed and really doesn't have any other signs. Uh, 
For diagnosis, EGD is going to be the best initial diagnostic step. That just kind of works into our initial workup anyway. Uh, this is really hard to find on EGD, so a lot of times uh, the EGD's report is going to come back negative, nothing found. Um, so uh, after that, if, you're, uh, if you don't have any diagnosis, uh, you can do angiography, um, and that may help you. For treatment, once you've found the Dulafoy's lesion, uh, it's pretty much the same kind of thing that you're doing with the, uh, with, with the varices. You're going to be doing endoscopic treatment via coagulation, and it's an argon gas coagulation. Um, there's other ways you can treat it, though, but uh, it's just coagulation, endoscopic coagulation. So this is treated endoscopically. I think they can also do banding for it, but uh, it's treated endoscopically. So here's a Dulafoy's lesion. Kind of looks like a varus, but uh, it's not. So here's another one after it's been coagulated. You can see like the dead tissue around it, and so now it uh, stops the bleeding. Okay, peptic ulcer disease. So peptic ulcer disease is erosive ulceration of the stomach or duodenum. There's lots of things that can cause this. Uh, so uh, peptic ulcer disease, idiopathic, or due to, uh, due to um, uh, NSAIDs or aspirin or due to Helicobacter pylori, there's lots of things that can cause peptic ulcer disease. Um, so when you look into the history, of course, somebody with peptic ulcer disease, they may have a uh, past diagnosed history of it. They may be on chronic NSAIDs for pain. They may be on a daily aspirin. Uh, or they may just have a history of chronic fatigue, and that just indicates that they've had this uh, slow blood loss. Symptom-wise, uh, usually this is going to present as melina, uh, either because the ulcer is in the duodenum uh, or because the ulcer is in the stomach, but usually it's a, it's a pretty slow blood loss. But it can present as hematemesis as well. Uh, it can also present as right upper quadrant pain. Uh, that's typically uh, a, a, an ulcer of the duodenum. It can also present as epigastric pain, especially postprandial epigastric pain because after you eat, you start secreting that acid and that's going to, uh, that's going to irritate the ulcer. A big thing that uh, hints you off towards peptic ulcer disease, when you place that NG tube, uh, if you're getting what's called coffee ground emesis out of the uh, out of the NG tube, uh, that's typical of peptic ulcer disease, and all that is is it's blood that's been uh, oxidized uh, into uh, this uh, this iron looking uh, material. It looks like coffee grounds, and so uh, that's something that uh, this uh, word that you hear thrown around, coffee ground emesis and it would be sucked up through the uh, NG tube. So like I said, sometimes there's uh, epigastric pain, sometimes right upper quadrant pain, and then some of these patients may have signs of chronic anemia, such as fatigue or pallor. Labs, usually the only thing you're gonna see is anemia. Uh, if you get iron studies, which can be useful as well, it will usually be the iron deficiency anemia. Um, anytime a patient has very severe pain, uh, pain that's worse than what they normally have, you should get an upper chest x-ray or, or sorry, lower chest x-ray or upper abdominal x-ray uh, in both the left lateral decubitus position and upright position to evaluate for perforation. So we're looking for, uh, we're looking for escaped air. And uh, a lot of times the easy way to diagnose that is looking underneath the diaphragm. So that's an additional thing to get if they're having uh, severe pain because we want to know if there's a perforation. For diagnosis, again, the best initial diagnostic test here for suspected uh, bleeding peptic ulcer is going to be uh, EGD, endoscopy. And uh, biopsy should also be performed uh, to check for H. pylori, especially if they don't have a past history of peptic ulcer disease. Um, and also, it may be useful to get a biopsy to check for gastric cancer uh, or changes because peptic ulcers can lead to cancer. What do we do for treatment? The treatment for peptic ulcer disease is a proton pump inhibitor, a meprazole, or lansoprazole, or uh, esomeprazole, any of the proton pump inhibitors. You won't be asked to choose between them. Uh, if H. pylori is positive, 
uh, which is why we're getting the biopsy. Then you'll add antibiotics, and that's clarithromycin and ampicillin. And so together, the PPI and then the two antibiotics is called triple therapy. But we only do that if the H. pylori is positive. If, if the H. pylori is negative, then we uh, antibiotics are useless. Uh, clarithromycin and ampicillin are typically the two drugs that are used. However, if the patient is penicillin allergic, uh, then we can substitute uh, flagyl, metronidazole. Okay, remember your general GI alarm symptoms. So maybe you were thinking back here, why don't we get a, uh, a CLO test, the, the urease breath test, or why don't we get H. pylori antigens? Why are we going in with an EGD and taking a biopsy? So these GI alarm symptoms, which uh, we've talked about in other sections, and that's weight loss, anemia, heme-positive stools, or hematemesis, uh, which is any GI bleed, early satiety, adenophagia, or dysphagia, or a patient older than the age of 45, those are all alarm symptoms. And so for any patient that has any of these uh, criteria, they get an EGD. And so if we're already going in to do an EGD, well, we may as well just do a biopsy because that's your definitive test for H. pylori. That's the best test you can do, the most accurate test. You'll actually be able to see the, uh, the H. pylori uh, bacteria on, uh, on your biopsy. So uh, if they have any of these uh, criteria, and they always will if we're talking about GI bleeding, uh, then you're going to just go straight to an EGD and you'll get a biopsy then. If for instance, though, they were a peptic ulcer disease patient, you suspect peptic ulcer disease, but they didn't fit any of these criteria, say it was a health, otherwise healthy 28-year-old, uh, then you can go ahead and do the H. pylori antibody test or a urease breath test rather than going right to EGD. So I talk about this in the gastroenterology section. So here is an EGD uh, with a bleeding ulcer. You can't, oh, no, you can't actually see the ulcer. Yeah, this is... This is shooting pretty good here. Uh, so here's your ulcer, and uh, you can see this would be that coffee ground stuff that I was talking about. Look how dark that blood is. Uh, this is what you would see when you're pumping out the blood from, uh, from the uh, NG tube. But you can see here, this is bright red blood, and this is coming straight out of the ulcer. Here's another ulcer. Uh, so this one is either healed or... Uh, or might have been coagulated or something. Can't really tell. And then here's an ulcer in the duodenum. They can be there too, so you're definitely going to want to check. And there's your uh, EGD device here. Okay. A couple other things about peptic ulcer disease, not really peptic ulcers, but ulcers. Remember your ICU patients. So patients who have sustained head injuries are at risk for Cushing's ulcer. And that's just a regular ulcer, but it's caused from a head injury. And when you get a head injury, it can cause some dysregulation of the vagus nerve. And remember, the vagus nerve secretes acetylcholine, and it uh, tells your stomach to make acid. And so if that gets dysregulated, you're at higher risk for uh, an ulcer. Uh, patients who have sustained burns are at risk for a curling's ulcer just because uh, in, the, uh, in, in the interim after they have their burn, they're usually in a low fluid state and that can cause them gastric ischemia. Uh, so that's a curling's ulcer. And then patients who are on mechanical ventilation just out of their body being in a stressed situation are at risk for a stress ulcer. Not really sure why this happens. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's idiopathic as far as what we know, but maybe gastric ischemia as well. So these patients will all be in the ICU, and they should all be on prophylactic proton pump inhibitors to prevent ulcers. Okay, Meckel's diverticulum. This is typically a problem of pediatrics, but it can come up in adults. I've even seen it come up in adults as old as 40, uh, just one time, but uh, it's, uh, it can happen in adult medicine. Uh, so what a Meckel's diverticulum is, is a vestigial remnant, and it follows these, this law of twos. So it's present in approximately 2% of the population. It's around 2 feet, roughly 2 feet, plus or minus a few inches from the ileocecal valve. Uh, it's about 2, 2 and a half inches long. It uh, usually presents in patients under the age of 2, it's got a two-to-one ratio of males to females, and there's two kinds of ectopic tissue. Uh, 
gastric and pancreatic that are in the Meckel's diverticulum. So that's you can you can impress your uh, surgery attendings if you uh, if you remember that. Uh, so because it contains uh, ectopic gastric and pancreatic mucosa, but mostly because of the gastric, uh, it can cause bleeding because the gastric mucosa secretes pepsin, and uh, that's going to ultimately cause bleeding. Uh, like I said, usually this is a disorder of pediatrics, but it can present in adults. But usually with adults, it's going to present a little differently. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so pediatric patients, the way they present classically with Meckel's diverticulum is the painless uh, red current, uh, not red current jelly, sorry, painless hematochesia uh, or maroon stool. It could be bright red blood per rectum uh, or it could be maroon stool. With adults... Or an older child, so it's older than the age of two, um, but we're talking probably like six, seven, eight years old at least, or in adults, uh, it can cause crampy abdominal pain and melena. And now the reason that in the pediatric patient, in a very, very young patient, a toddler, that it cause, it can cause hematochesia or bright, bright red blood per rectum uh, is because they just have a faster transit time. So things just get worked through their intestines a lot quicker. Whereas with adults, things move a little bit more deliberately. So uh, it has nothing to do with difference in the Meckel's diverticulum. It just has to do with how fast things are moving along. Uh, but in adults, oftentimes there is some crampy abdominal pain associated with the melena. It can also present without bleeding, um, in, especially in children uh, or, or, I suppose, adults. Um, and those are some of the big problems with Meckel's diverticulum. And when I tell you that I've seen a patient present with Meckel's diverticulum, that's what I'm talking about. You can get uh, right lower quadrant pain with Meckel, Meckel's diverticulum, and it can get uh, confused with appendicitis. Um, you go in laparoscopically looking for an inflamed appendix, and lo and behold, it's not there. And uh, so you should always then go look for your Meckel's diverticulum, and uh, you may be able to find it. And that would uh, that, that can be inflamed. And so uh, Meckel's diverticulum can present without bleeding. It can. There's other problematic things that it can do. It can also uh, cause uh, telescoping into susception uh, of the intestine, and that can be very problematic as well. So, but we're, what we're talking about here is bleeding. So this is a common way for Meckel's to present. For diagnosis, diagnosis of Meckel's diverticulum is suggested when the stool guaiac is positive, but there's no blood retrieved via the NG tube, and that makes sense because this is in the distal small intestine, and there's no source of bleeding found on EGD because in the EGD we're only going as far as the duodenum. So you can't find any blood in what we would call the upper GI tract, but we still have... Uh, melena. So that's where we would suspect a Meckel's diverticulum. And the best diagnostic test to do when you suspect a Meckel's diverticulum is the technetium 99 scintigraphy. Technetium 99 scintigra scintigraphy, or might just be referred to as the technetium 99 scan. And what this is, uh, is a nuclear substance that's taken up uh, by the gastric mucosa. And we look at it, and we uh, and we see on the scan uh, where the uh, substance has been taken up. And the treatment, the definitive treatment, is a Meckel's diverticulectomy. Uh, but you can also staple the diverticulum off, and that will present uh, prevent uh, more of that acid uh, pepsin from going out into the uh, into the intestine. So this is a technetium 99 scan, and this is a normal scan. So the black part here. Uh, is the uh, where the technetium is. Uh, so this is uh, over elapsed period of time. So you can see here it's in the stomach, a little bit of it in the t intestines, and then in the bladder. So it's concentrated in the stomach and in the bladder, and that's where it should be. Because you've got gastric mucosa in your stomach, uh, and then in the bladder, that's where it all pools up after uh, uh, once it gets eliminated. Okay, now here on the other hand, uh, you've got a Meckel's diverticulum. So here it is in the stomach, and then uh, in this, you've got this little dot here, and this is your Meckel's diverticulum. Here's another one. This is just uh, this is just the colors are just reversed here, and you got a Meckel's diverticulum here. Okay, uh, 
So here's what a Meckles diverticulum looks like. Here it was resected. And you could also staple it off, but that just depends on the surgeon. You'll not, you will definitely not be asked to, to decide which of the two to do. But you want to remove it or staple it off when uh, if the patient's got uh, bleeding due to Meckel's diverticulum. Okay, gastric or esophageal cancer. I don't really know why I put these two together. It's kind of stupid of me. But uh, these are two different cancers. And, of course, cancer can cause bleeding because it's unstable tissue. And so, uh, classically, uh, these, uh, both of these cancers present in older patients with risk factors for either of them. The risk factors are a little different, though. So, gastric cancer, these are patients who have established peptic ulcer disease, especially H. pylori infection, um, use tobacco, radiation exposure, pernicious anemia, uh, and then uh, a diet high in smoked or salted foods. With esophageal cancer, uh, that's uh, the risk factors for that are gastroesophageal reflux disease, especially if it's caused Barrett's esophagus, and then um, that's for the uh, adenocarcinoma, and then the squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, uh, the risk factors for that are smoking and alcohol use. The symptoms, of course, are going to depend on the type. So with gastric cancer, you typically have epigastric pain. With esophageal cancer, you typically have dysphagia, uh, first to solids, and then progressively onto liquids. Both of these are going to cause weight loss, fatigue, pain, lymphadenopathy, um, just like any cancer would. Uh, especially in the supraclavicular cervical, um, and for gastric cancer, the periumbilical lymph node. Um, and that's called the Sister Mary Joseph node. I was going to look for a picture of Sister Mary Joseph to put up on here, but I couldn't find one. Okay, diagnosis. Gastric cancer is diagnosed with EGD with biopsy. That's the best initial step in diagnosis. Esophageal cancer, a little bit different. Barium esophagram is the best initial step because we're extremely worried about perforation. Uh, and so we want to know where approximately the cancer is before we go and stick that tube in there. With gastric cancer, we already know it's in the stomach. Uh, so with esophageal cancer, we'll do barium esophagram first, then we'll do the EGD with biopsy. And the treatment is, has nothing to do with bleeding. We'll talk about that somewhere else. I already talked about the esophageal uh, cancer treatment in uh, the dysphagia section. And then some of the other things that cause upper GI bleeding, so a Mallory Weiss tear, which I talked about in the esophageal perforation section. This is a superficial tear of the esophageal mucosa, uh, pretty much always secondary to strong vomiting and retching, uh, especially after a good night out of uh, hitting the bars and drinking alcohol. Uh, usually this is, this is always bright hematemesis, and it follows, like I said, that strong vomiting and retching. Diagnosis is made on EGD, and you'll see these uh, superficial tears. Treatment, usually you don't have to do anything other than stabilize the patient, supportive therapy. Usually it's self-limited. Uh, however, if you do have continued bleeding, you can endoscopically coagulate the tears. Celiac disease is an autoimmune reaction to a wheat allergen, uh, specifically gliadin. And uh, this results in sloughing of the intestinal mucosa, which can ultimately result in some bleeding. And the bleeding you're going to see here is melena. So oftentimes it's accompanied with melena, and because you've got, uh, you've got a disease of your intestine, it impairs absorption, and that causes steatorrhea, mal uh, malnutrition, and abdominal pain. Uh, because you've got the steatorrhea, you're not absorbing the fat, and so some of the, a lot of these patients are very thin. Uh, this is a very chronic disease. It's with you for life, and it's also very underdiagnosed. We've got a much bigger awareness about this now than we did 10 years ago. Uh, for diagnosis, uh, you can do anti-tissue transglutaminase and anti-gliadin titers. Uh, the definitive diagnosis for celiac is EGD with biopsy. The treatment is a gluten-free diet, which is a big pain in the butt for, uh, for patients with celiac because... Our American diet is full of processed food with wheat in it. Esophagitis and gastritis, there's tons of causes, especially certain pills. And when I'm uh, talking about certain pills, I am pointing at bisphosphonates, which little old ladies take for their, uh, uh, for their, um, their bone issues. Uh, and then uh, NSAIDs 
aspirin, and uh, alcohol. Osteoporosis. Man, that, that word did not come to my head. Esophageal or abdominal pain uh, is prominent with esophag esophagitis and gastritis, and that makes sense because you've got an inflammation of, uh, of very sensitive tissue, um, especially tissue that's exposed to acid or tissue uh, that food is moving down and rubbing up against. And so esophageal or abdominal pain is prominent, respectively. If you do have bleeding, it's usually going to be melena. It can be severe or it can be totally unnoticed. Best way to diagnose this is with EGD. It's really the only way to diagnose it because you can't, the only way to see if there's inflammation of the esophagus or stomach is to actually look at it. Treatment is going to be based on the underlying problem. If they're popping NSAIDs all the time, they need to stop. If they're popping aspirin all the time, they probably need to cut back on it. If they're drinking alcohol, they should probably cut back on it. If they're taking bisphosphonates, they should probably be standing up and walking around for 30 minutes and drinking a good amount of water to flush that pill through. Uh, shouldn't be laying down after you take those pills. So uh, based on the underlying problem. And then usually we'll also give them proton pump inhibitors as well. Um, that can uh, relieve some of the symptoms. And then finally, the aortoenteric fistula. It's a rare complication of uh, a uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. What it is is just fistulization from the aorta, usually to the duodenum. And the, of course, the only way you're going to be able to diagnose this is with EGD. Ultimately, um, also you can use... Uh, I suppose you can use CT, but EGD would probably be the best diagnosis. And then the treatment is going to be surgical repair. This is a bad, bad, bad thing. Um, it's got a pretty, uh, pretty bad mortality rate. It's usually around 50 to 70 percent, if not higher. Uh, so this is not good. So on that happy note, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. But with that, uh, that's it.